How's and how's it? Welcome back to the channel. It is fantastic to have you here. Today, we're going to be looking at simple techniques that you can employ using any camera to create motion blur, shutter drag, that creative expression of movement within your images. Stop thinking about light as a static thing that is simply there to illuminate a subject. Think about it as a tool within your visual toolbox that you can employ in a liquidy kind of way, that it can ebb and flow across the center. It can create crazy patterns, crazy ideas, wonderfully abstract things and, and bring a sense of life to your images. You can do this by leaving your shutter open for a longer time than is normally required. Often in today's modern world, you're told that there are very rules, there are strict rules about, you know, shutter speeds and focal lengths and stuff. And that's because everybody is obsessed with sharpness in their images. But today we're not concerned with sharpness. We are concerned with blurriness, with that indistinct feeling that I feel is so vital to making your images feel alive. Because that's really what Thing, you know, brings a photograph off the screen and really captivates us is a sense of aliveness because we're seeing the world or being shown the world in a way that we cannot with our own two eyes. There's a lot of mumbo jumbo, higgledy piggledy kind of stuff that gets talked about, you know, shutter speeds and all that sort of thing. And for the sake of this video, there's only two things I want you to bear in mind regarding the technical side of things. One, is that you're gonna put your camera onto shutter priority. Whatever camera you're using, there's a shutter priority option, unless you're very old school, right? Okay, put it on shutter priority, let the camera deal with the exposures and the rest of the stuff. All we're interested in in this exercise is playing with the length of time the shutter is open. And that's the next thing. So basically, the, the slower the motion of the subject, the longer, exposure, you're going to need to get some movement into that. And conversely, if, if something is, is moving very quickly, you can actually use a very sh quick shutter speed and still get motion in there. And this is why you won't find a definitive answer about how and what shutter speeds to use. It's very much dependent on the effect you're going for and the, 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 the speed of the motion of the image the, or the object that you're photographing. So now that you know that the lens, you know, is being open for a length of time is going to introduce some motion into images, there's a couple of ways that you can actually use that motion. And the first of them is panning. So you, again, this is a very, uh, you know, it's not, it's not a hidden secret, that's, that's for sure, right? And you've seen it quite a lot. It's those images where the photographer's standing there and they pan with the sub. And here's some examples like with race cars, you know, it's a fairly obvious thing where the photographer moves the camera, keeping the car more or less in the same point of the frame as they move the camera. So that means that the, the, the car or the object being photographed retains some of its detail while the background becomes a smear. The longer that the shutter is open or the slower that the object is moving, the more smeary, if you want to call it, because that's a technical term, <laughs> yes, smeary, the object is going to be. A fast car, shoom, at 500 of a second is going to be frozen in time because it's just really moved just a fraction, whereas the rest of the stuff, relatively speaking, has moved a lot. So that's again an illustration of why there isn't like a defined figure, a number that I can say to you, this is exactly what you want. It's up to you how you want to employ motion in your photographs with the technique of panning. Do you want very subtle, like the lady's hair, or do you want it to be almost completely abstract to the point where it is just smears of indistinct light. It's it's a wonderful thing, you know, <laughs> to, to quote, you know, Tony Montana, you know, the world is yours. Well, he didn't say it, but the Goodyear blimp said it, but you get my point. So as a middle ground, how do you introduce just a little bit of motion to give your images a sense of life? Well, think about those photographs that you've seen, I'm sure at some point of, you know, ladies with long hair, where there's a, an explosion of hair and the hair has been static, it's, it's fixed in place and it doesn't move. Now that's okay, right? But the hair feels lifeless because hair doesn't do that in real life. It moves and you 
introduce just a subtle amount of motion blur to give the hair a life and a vibrancy by keeping the shutter open just a little bit longer than you probably would to freeze the motion. So in this case, let's say a one one twenty fifth of a second would be enough to freeze the motion, right? Let's go to an eightieth of a second. So it's open for a little bit longer because that might give the tips of her hair time to move, but it would keep the rest of her face static because her face obviously is not moving at the same speed as the tips of her hair. You can see this in work again, this wonderful photograph. This is awesome. This is a lovely photograph of this bird in flight. The photographer is panning with the, with the bird as it flies and has a shutter speed that is enough to freeze the motion of the bird's head and its beak, but is long enough to let the wings have a flutter, have a, have a sense of purpose because, you know, birds fly, they move. That's the beauty of these things. See how even just a little step out from what's the norm for a sharp image, all of a sudden lends your photographs a sense of life. And that's what I love about photographs. They have a sense of life that they must be vibrant, not from a color point of view, but, but a, an image that has movement for me is so exciting. Take this photograph of a lady in front of a carousel at a fairground. Now, that's wonderful. And I hope you're beginning to see about how this might actually have been achieved. So, you know, the photographer's standing there and they've gone, oh, well, I see the carousel is moving. And they've gone, oh, well, maybe like, you know, a, a fifth of a second or half of a second would be long enough to get a lot of, you know, motion through the carousel but it's also short enough that I could probably handhold this image because my friend standing by the railings there, she's not going to move. And what I'll do is to make sure she won't move is I'm going to pop some flash on her, A, to bring her up to the same exposure as the carousel, but also that's going to be a very short boof on the, the sensor of light hitting the sensor. And the rest of the time she's going to be dark and it won't interfere too much. And that's a little bit more of a, of a, you know, a, a, a next level kind of motion blur. And if you'd like me to go into more depth about that in another video, then please, you know, do let me know in the comments below. But see what's happened is, so the, the photographers combine anything. If that carousel was frozen in motion, the, the, the image would be too busy, right? But because they've allowed the carousel to smear its light all over the sensor, it's become broken down into an abstract form. And that's why you see quite often, you know, illustrations of motion in images being photographed like with light trails and what have you, because it's easy to explain what's going on. You can see what's what's happening in the image. And, and let's be frank, they are quite, they're quite dramatic and they look pretty cool. At this point, you may be thinking, OK, well, Alex is only talking about things that move things that are in motion, and that's what you get the motion. Now you can introduce motion blur into objects that are static. Look at these, these photographs here, right? So these I took in our dining room the other night. The light was wonderful. I thought, okay, well, just, let's just take some pictures with my phone. There's nothing special here. And that's why I said you can do this with, with any you know, camera, anything that can take photographs. And I went, okay, well, I'm gonna use these actually as an example to show to you. So here's somewhere I took, you know, it's, it's, it's fairly static. And then there's a you know, longer exposure and I've kind of moved the camera around a bit like that, you know, but sort of back and forth. And then I've, I've kind of spun the camera a little bit to create other effects. I've moved it in various ways during the exposure to create environments that are ethereal, strange, unusual, different to what we would normally see. Now, this is not the world's greatest photographs, I concede, you know, they are, they are <laughs> illustrations, but I want you to see that you don't need to have static, so you don't need to have motion in the images inherently, just to have motion. You can bring it into anything. One of those photographs was like a spinning kind of effect, and that's kind of very close to zooming as well. There's a thing you can do, if you have a zoom lens with a long exposure, during the length of the exposure, you can change the focal length of the image and you'll get the zoom effect. 
you know, we've also seen that. Now, at a very basic level, that can be a little bit, a little bit cliched. And that's always, I think, you know, something an important thing to consider with all of these ideas is that don't just use them for the sake of using them. Use them if you're going to use them for a, a reason. They're not going to make a boring photograph look great by just, you know, zooting them up. Right? Look at those, those tables, <laughs> those, those landscapes, not the landscape, my lounge images. They're okay, but they don't become amazing because I put an effect on them. Now, if you don't have a zoom lens, you can, of course, move. You can run towards the subject. You could, if you are dexterous enough, run away from the subject. But that will introduce a zoom kind of feel. You know, so you can see how you're, you're playing with things. You're throwing out a lot of the rules that you're saying, I don't care, I'm going to try things out. I remember, you know, taking some photographs of a wood during, uh, you know, my application for photo school. And I went, well, uh, pictures of wood are kind of boring. And I'd seen an image in a, in a magazine. I went, I'll give that a try. And I had a half a second exposure and I just jumped up and down. Of course, the beauty was I didn't know what I was going to get, you know, especially given this was film. And that's the wonderfulness about this. This is not the same as sticking on Photoshop filters, you know, the blur effect or the motion or the radial blur and these sort of things. They give you a somewhat repeatable, you know, uh, 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 well, effect. What we are looking here is throwing ourselves on the mercy of light and photography and seeing what it comes up with. Take a moment, look at some of these photographs and, and think for a second if you can recognize the technique that the photographer is employing within the image. Is it a very subtle motion blur or are they panning? Are they zooming in and out? Are they jumping around? Is the subject in motion or is the camera in motion? There are an infinite variety of ways that you can create these wonderful, vibrant and exciting photographs. Just have the, the, the ability to not worry too much about if you are doing it right or wrong. I cannot stress this enough. In this area of photography, there is nothing that is defined. There is nothing that is right. There's nothing that is wrong. It is entirely up to you and what you are trying to achieve, the, the motion and the feeling. You will know when it's right for what it is that you want to do. So just have that freedom of expression, of, of seeing what happens. There's some photographs here that I'm showing you which come from that exact idea of trying things out. They were photographed in my studio. I said we weren't going to talk about, you know, any special equipment or what have you. And there is no studio light on this. This is using the fluorescent overheads in my studio. But I was like, oh, do you know, I'm going to try and photograph in the worst lighting conditions I can possibly think of. And I tried things out. I tried a long exposure and all these sort of things. And what happened was that I thought, well, okay, well, it's just this bit of a blur, it's a bit of a thing. But what if I just take one of my little handheld flashes and just pop that flash originally, or if I asked the person to move around just a little bit and see what happens. And I'm going to give you a practical demonstration on screen here. So, you know, I've now reduced the shutter speed on this and you can see that I'm moving around. I've got a bit of motion, but you see how my hands are going woo like this, but my face is kind of somewhat static. That's what we looking to do with these. We can play with ideas. We can bring in lots of different techniques and explore to just see what happens. Anyway, so here we are. We're back into the world of like kind of regular shutter speeds. And those images came from me being inspired by a photographer called Nadev Kander, who does some very interesting things with motion, very subtly within his photographs. And I was trying to replicate that by dissecting and looking into his images. If you'd like to see more of that kind of content here, where I look at famous photographers, take apart their images, see how we can implement those ideas in our own photography, then again, please let me know in the comments below. Finding inspiration for using these techniques that you've kind of 
learn here. And you can sort of see that really, you know, it boils down to just kind of leave the shutter open and see what happens. Is is wonderful because you see so many ideas and so many directions of things that you had never thought of. A photographer like Ernst Haas uses longer exposures, longer shutter speeds to bring a sense of motion and artistic sort of blurriness to bullfighting. He's not showing the bullfighting per se, but he's showing the feeling of that frenzy of emotion. It's in the images. There is a Japanese photographer called Hiroshi Sugimoto who goes to the extreme. He photographs candles as they burn down, as they, you know, just disintegrate into nothing and has these massively long exposures. We, we can't see a candle burn down in its entirety. So what a wonderful way of looking at the world. Chris McCaw has a book, which I've talked about on the channel before, called Sunburn, where he has taken images of the sun traversing the sky. And as it has done so, it has burnt physical holes into the film that he's taking the pictures with. These are all examples of, of long exposure. Sports photographers, you know, they are masters of introducing either, you know, the, the feeling and that emotion like Ernst Haas into a sport or giving us a real sense of motion and of movement. That's all you know, about introducing that life into the image, the movement. And you can do this with whatever camera that you have. You don't need a fancy camera. You don't need any lenses. If you want the longer exposure, or, you know, a, a tripod's going to help you and there's some neutral density filters and that's really kind of beyond the remit of this. This is about encouraging you to go out there to take photographs of things in motion, to show the people who look at your images the world that they cannot see. It doesn't matter if you picked up a camera last week or you've had a camera for 20 years. You can learn something new by letting the camera show you what life looks like at 130th of a second and slower. He said that was a really weird sort of thing because I got to the end of that and I went, hang on, 130th of a second is A, it's not a real shutter speed. <laughs> also, it's very, very quick. But anyway, you know my point. Go out and see what the world looks like when you look at it with eyes that you can't. For more practical ways that you can harness the power of light within your images, no matter your skill level. Go and check out this video over here because I know that it'll be exceptionally useful for you. Thank you ever so much for watching and I'll see you again soon.